Um, it's now with great pleasure that I welcome Professor Douglas Clark from the top-ranking Peabody College of Education and Human Development at Vanderbilt University. As you will learn during his lecture, Doug studies how people understand core science concepts. The challenge of teaching science is significant today more than ever before. We live in a world where on the one hand the rate of scientific and technological progress is constantly on the rise, while on the other hand fundamental issues in science are being challenged by significant sectors in society. We see how elementary scientific concepts such as theory are being politicized and corrupted by the climate change controversy, and how young minds are deprived of gaining a contemporary understanding of biology and of health by leaders who mistakenly perceive faith and science to be mutually exclusive entities. In this context, the main themes that are interwoven in Doug's research, themes such as linking scientific thinking with everyday life, argumentation, conceptual change, these concepts are essential to science education as well as to the future of our society. The potential of Doug's work has been recognized through multi-million dollar grants from the NSF, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Education in the US, and the National Academy of Education Spencer Foundation. But Doug's work is not only important, it's also fun. His work attempts to achieve important learning outcomes in science education through the design of digital learning environments and games. We all know that games teach, but the work Doug carries out in collaboration with colleagues and students helps us achieve our goals as educators and to ensure that players not only learn from games, but they that they learn the right things, that they can articulate that newly gained knowledge, and that this knowledge is transferred from the virtual world to the classroom and beyond into the lives of the learners. I remind students before the talk, that the uh, uh, students in the audience, that the talk will be followed by a closed meeting with Doug in the Kanbar Hall upstairs. Over 70 students have already pre-registered to the meeting, but there might be a few extra places in the room. We'll open the room to unregistered students five minutes before the start of the meeting. So if you're registered, be there early. I want to thank Doug for making the effort and joining us here in, at the Chase Conference and invite him to present his exciting work. Doug, please. One more thing, the lights will be on because we're videoing the lecture. It might, you know, make the pictures uh, a little fuzzier, but it means you can come back to this uh, lecture and view it online later. Can you turn that one on? So, um, yeah. So I'm Doug Clark, and I'd like to thank you very much for coming. I'm going to talk about games and motivation and learning. And I'd like to especially thank my um, hosts, Yoram and Yoram. Yoram Eshet is an inspiring person who has already changed my way of looking at the world. So I'd like to thank him for everything he does for everyone. <laughs> All right, this works. Excellent. So in an earlier talk, I had pointed out that a lot of the work over the last decade on games has focused on a very simplistic question, this idea, are games good, are games bad? And I've highlighted the idea that that's not the right question. It's a very simplistic question. It's like asking whether labs are good or bad. Um, they're a medium. Games are a medium. Simulations are a medium. Books are a medium. Digital books aren't good or bad. And you guys are arguing about that. The idea of we have digital books, this is wonderful, um, no, it depends on what those digital books are. Um, and so in the National um, Research Council in the U.S. Uh, did a report on labs and highlighted this idea um, that it's the, how the affordances of that medium are designed and harnessed that matter. And in the same way, games are a medium with affordances. So that's what we really need to be thinking about, not like, oh, it's a game, it has points and badges, but um, what, what are the characteristics of the design that are contributing to the learning that you care about, and is it learning that we should care about? So every once in a while, we're going to come to a gray slide like this, and this is just because it's sort of a longer talk. And so we have questions. So you sort of know where we are, and I know where we are. And a, a worthwhile question um, 
this is what is a game first. And before we can talk about that, we've got to talk about digital simulations. And when I'm talking about digital simulations, I'm talking about computational models of real or hypothesized situations or phenomena where users can explore the implications of manipulating or modifying the parameters within the models. And I have some pictures on the side of various simulations. No shock for people here. And uh, a lot of my work is focused on physics. And here if there's a, a group, uh, group in the U.S. called FET that makes a lot of simulations. Here's a picture of the various some of the various simulations they've created. There's something that Barbara White created. And then up there you see, wow, um, that's a game we created that actually shares a lot of similarities. So apparently simulations of games can have some overlap. And if we look at other educational games, a lot of them have simulations at their core. Um, and they look a lot more fun, actually. But it's beyond just educational games. If we look at, um, here's Tiger Woods Golf, and there's World of Warcraft. Simulations are at the heart of, of many commercial games. In fact, most commercial games. So obviously there's a lot of overlap between simulations and games, but how are games different? And um, historically, if we talk about Huizinga and a lot of the other scholars that have talked about games, there's a general consensus across definitions that games focus on some combination of rules, choices, play, and systems for tracking progress or success. And there's usually some discussion of the fact that it involves um, an artificial challenge that someone willingly takes up. I mean, obviously, um, our job involves a lot of these rules, um, ways for tracking progress. So there's, um, and people talk about sort of a magic circle into which someone um, enters. But for the purposes of today, just to keep things more simple in terms of the distinction with simulations, talking about the fact that digital models um, that allow users to make interesting choices with meaningful implications. Oh, left that one behind. Um, and does this go back? No. <laughs> we'll go this way. Um, an overarching set of explicit goals with a, a custom, accompanying system for measuring progress and subjective opportunities for play and engagement. Um, and then a third piece that can uh, gets confused. Virtual worlds um, can be, games can be virtual worlds. Virtual worlds can be simulations. All three of these things can overlap. My work um, is, when I'm talking, it's really independent of the virtual world part. Where I'm really interested is the intersection of the digital games and digital simulations. So most of what I'm talking about is specifically about that. So now then the next question is, do people learn? Or can they learn? And what can they learn? And what we see, and this is what everyone's sort of excited about, about games, um, commercial games are very good at helping their learners um, develop mastery over the models inherent in the simulations in those games. And it's interesting because a lot of other commercial media, like Hollywood movies, um, it's fine to be simple. In fact, it's better if you're simple because then you don't need people to understand even what's being said and you can sell it around the world um, to large numbers of audiences. And people are generally happy, just so it's flashy. And people think about that often when they, though that's what games are, it's because they're flashy or they're fun or they're exciting or they're novel. And that's, that's what's good about games. And then that's how we end up with a lot of not so good games for learning. Um, instead, if we think about why, what it is about commercial games that's so successful, it can help us think about what might be good for learning games. And whereas simple is okay for the movies, uh, most commercial games to be successful need to have um, relatively complex models at their heart if people are going to continue to play over time. And this isn't just something that academics think. Um, Raf Koster, who is the chief financial financial officer for Sony Online Entertainment, a very big undertaking. His book, A Theory of Fun, makes clear that a game that doesn't continue to be challenging and evolve in its challenge quickly um, becomes boring. And so here you have an interesting challenge because if it's simple, nobody's going to buy it. But if it's complex and people can't learn how to play it, they're not going to buy it. So over time there have been a lot of commercial pressures in um, to develop conventions that support learners in developing these intuitive understandings to allow them to operate over time with in increasing sophistication on the underlying models. And if the user can't learn that, 
the user's not going to pay the money, and that's going to go away. And over time, this Darwinian pressure has evolved some interesting conventions that um, we're going to come... Well, but one, one important distinction to make, though, is that there have been no um, commercial pressures on digital game companies to support learning that can be transferred beyond the digital game. And there has been no commercial pressure on game companies for users to be able to articulate that understanding. Those aren't necessary components for a successful commercial game. So people who just say, let's make it like a commercial game, are losing sight of the fact that our learning goals are different than those of the commercial game industry. So that's so while there is much for us to learn from commercial game design conventions, we also have to be aware that our goals are different, and thus we have to go beyond those conventions. So in terms of work, we've done our group, and I'm just holding, talking about our group, but it's this mirrors work by several other groups. What we've seen is, it is there are a, lot, a, a range of kinds of learning can be supported, um, from conceptual understanding to uh, um, deeper epistemological understanding, gains in players' willingness and ability to engage with scientific practices. But leveraging these affordances depends entirely on design. Just making it a game doesn't ensure that learning is going to happen, just like making something a digital book doesn't ensure that some learning is going to happen. I keep mentioning digital books because I know there's a big, um, big debate right now about whether just having digital books is in and of itself uh, an effective solution for learning or whether design might matter and how we're using them and for what reasons and towards what ends. Um, and in a meta-analysis that we're conducting, and actually um, in the last few weeks, uh, online um, a journal of educational psychology has released a meta-analysis out of Utrecht University. And what we're seeing, um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this, but both our, our meta-analysis and theirs demonstrate that games can enhir enhance learning of cognitive and some intrapersonal um, competencies. And they demonstrate that certain types of game structures may be more effective for certain types of outcomes. And it, but again, they both underscore the importance of design. And ours is even more focused on that than the Journal of Educational Psychology meta-analysis in the sense that they only looked at comparisons of games to other forms of instruction, whereas we also look at what Mayer refers to as value-added studies, where you compare specific designs or variants of games. To, and, um, so again, this, this, un, this theme of design matters comes across strongly. Another thing that people are concerned about is, well, is it only for certain groups of people? Perhaps it's just young boys who learn. But in fact, we've seen across a number of studies that, again, depending on design, you can have a, um, equal learning outcomes across um, cultures, genders, and um, independent of prior gaming experience. Again, as with everything else, it comes to design. So, um, so what are these affordances that we're talking about? And you'll hear a lot of, at the most shallow level, you'll hear about, oh, they're novel, or they're um, colorful, or there's action, or they're fun, which is, but um, there's certainly some aspect of engagement and affective investment that's important. And then there's consequential, this idea that what you do, your action has consequences, and there's um, opportunities for meaningful I, um, impact in the world. And that you can take on these identities um, that perhaps can be important by taking on a role of a scientist or taking on the role or um, these different roles you can begin to learn and um, even relate to um, these as something that you might be or do. Then of course a, an important a thing that I was originally very interested in games is they provide uh, while you have these complex simulations, I don't know, I mean, some people may have seen the early Sim Earth and Sim City, and these various Sims that Maxis made in the glory days. Um, and often they were just given to you, they were beautiful simulations, but they sort of just handed them to you without a whole lot of guidance. And for most people, um, were left at quite a loss. It took a, there was a very steep learning curve initially to figure out how to interact with this. But, but games provide a series of a sequence um, for interacting with aspects of the simulations, a guided trajectory, as well as just-in-time feedback um, for making sense and developing mastery over time with what's going on there. And another aspect that's interesting or affordance 
of games as well as a lot of other digital environments is they provide the opportunity to uh, collect data in real time about what the player is doing and then infer what that player might know or where that player might be stuck or what kinds of uh, experiences might be important next. And this is something the commercial game designers know as well. This is a heat map of um, player activity in a commercial game called Team Fortress 2. And the designers use, use this kind of data analysis to, figure, to refine and improve the experience uh, of, of players in terms of the design of the level. And down over to the um, left, there's some of our early work in terms of how would you make sense of players' data in terms of what they do or don't understand about Newton's first law as the person is coming around a corner. Um, but what the part I wanted to talk to you about really was about how games support engagement because this is something that I find um, the most superficial in the discussion about games and learning. This idea of games are engaging because they're fun. And, um, and a number of authors have created um, lists of aspects of games that contribute to engagement in terms of games from a, a game theory kind of perspective. But there's actually a lot of other work that um, I would encourage people to draw upon. In fact, a lot of, of careful research has been done in educational psychology on motivation to learn in classrooms. And um, Paul Pentrich it was one of these people. Uh, and in 2003, he wrote a synthesis of that research where he first distilled the research down into um, five constructs that he felt were well supported across the research. Um, and then he proposed design principles for leveraging those um, general constructs to, su to support motivation to learn in the classroom. And I, I would propose that it's, it's a very useful framework to draw upon because it, compared to a lot of the other work on games, there is actually a great depth of, um, and a history of research that is absent. Most of the other kinds of frameworks um, tend to be just um, opinion. Someone's opinion, they wrote a book, and those are all great books, but um, there's not a lot of research base for it. So, I, but we do have research bases that we might be drawing upon. So the first of these constructs was that adaptive self-efficacy and competence beliefs motivate students. And based on that, Pinterest suggested these two design principles provide clear and accurate feedback on the development of competence and self-efficacy, focusing on the development of competence, expertise, and skill and design tasks that offer opportunities to be successful but also challenge students. And interestingly, while the game industry was entirely unaware of any of this research, or largely, um, through this process of developing ways that could be commercially successful in helping people learn to play games, a number of these conventions developed that leveraged these same ideas. And it's worth looking at this because, maybe for three reasons. The first of them is, well, Pentridge's framework or other frameworks on motivation to learn um, from, from education and psychology help us think about what it is about games that is motivating to learn. So that's one reason to th it, that's helpful. Another is that we can start thinking about what we're doing in classes, in classrooms, that, uh, because we're often not leveraging these basic ideas that have been well researched and even seem like common sense in traditional instruction. And so by looking at uh, how successful games are doing these things that classrooms are so unsuccessful at doing traditionally, um, it can give us some ideas. And one of, one of these ideas that I find particularly important is this narrative of practice. And commercial games uniformly communicate to players that they can learn to play the game they can develop their expertise with time, and they should expect to succeed. And, and that seems reasonable, but I think if we all look at what's happening in classrooms around the world, or at least particularly in my country, that's not, that's not the assumption. And that's not the message we communicate. And that seems pretty basic. And to highlight it, so, so I think we could say this in Pinterest's principles to people in schools or administrators or policymakers, um, and they can say, oh yes, this is what we do. But I think if we showcase it against um, contexts such as games where it, where it actually does happen, I think it highlights what a poor job we are doing. Um, another interesting thing where we see in games in terms of this um, in our difficulty curves, where we increase challenge over time in line with a particular player's skill, 
reinforcing a player's belief that he or she can succeed through effort and practice and, uh, and master successfully more challenging um, contexts. I don't know how to make that go away. Oh, and here's and boss encounters. If only we could take something. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying we all need to be Link. This is Link, um, who is a very famous um, character from the video game world. And the idea of a boss encounter was, okay, we're going to have a, a number of levels that will go along where you're going to learn some new skills. And it's, we're going to make sure you can succeed at that. But then um, every once in a while, we're going to have a, have, have a situation where you need to pull together all of your skills and, and, and demonstrate um, some pro proficiency in integrating across those skills to master a challenging um, situation. And it will allow you to mark your, level, your, your progress. And it will also be a gatekeeper such that we're not going to let you go on until we know you have the skills to succeed. Um, this is, again, something we absolutely don't do in schools, at least in my country, and I believe not in your country. Another um, Pinterest's uh, core constructs was that adaptive attributions and control beliefs motivate students. And he suggested that we should be providing feedback that stresses the process nature of learning, including the importance of effort, strategies, and potential of self-control of learning, and provide opportunities to exercise some choice and control. And then the third one I want to come back to later, that's why it's grayed out, because there's an important role for teachers that the game, Games for Learning group tends to ignore in the research. So we're going to come back to that later. Because that, I mean, not all of this is saying games do it right or games for learning people do it right. There are a lot of implications for things that we're not doing as well as we, we should, and I'm going to come back to that later. But again, there's this narrative of practice. I mean, where the, I mean this, this kid obviously believes that he can succeed. What a novel idea. And that I, there ought to be dynamic control. Um, unlike more established um, media, such as books and potentially digital books, um, where the user is a passive recipient of information, the uh, core idea behind games is that uh, having dynamic control um, motivates people and is empowering. And this is, this is an aside, I didn't plan to mention this, but an interesting, there an, was an interesting study where with um, older people in a retirement home, they gave everyone a plant. And the difference was, for half of the elderly people, um, a person was assigned to come on a, on a daily basis to take care of the plant. And for the other half of the, of the elderly people, they were in charge of taking care of the plant. And the difference was, uh, was astonishing what it did for these elderly people to be given control of their plant, something they were responsible for and had control over, and it greatly improved their health, their mental health, and the and testament to it and sort of in a sad way, when, they, when the experiment was over and they took the plants away, the people who had had control and lost that control were devastated. There were alarming health effects and impact. So I mean, people, people fee having a sense of control and choice is very important, whether you're young, whether you're old, and we ignore that in education. Um, here's a character of mine. This is, um, a, a, this is a game, Guild Wars 2. And some of the kinds of choice are, oh, you can't really see it. Can we dim the lights just a little bit? Sigh. Maybe not. OK. <laughs> well, um, up at the top, you can see there's some very superficial kinds of choice we have that people still really like. I can change the way my head looks. You know, over time when I'm choosing, I can be male, female, whatever I like. Um, but more importantly, or also importantly, I make a lot of choices about how I want to go about doing the job I'm going to be doing in terms of so that this middle one here, I choose the, the abilities that I have that I'm going to be able to use. I choose the skills that I have. And this customization is, of, is very important to people. I've, on my nine-year-old son, I've been playing um, a, pu a puzzle game with him. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, and he, without even knowing what I was going to be talking about today, um, just a few days ago was saying, you know, Dad, I love this game. And I said, why do you like this game? Well, you get to choose how you're going to do it. You know, that was very important to him. Both the superficial, he likes to choose what he's going to look like, but he also likes to choose the abilities that he's going to have or the strategies he's going to use to try and um, tackle the puzzles. This is, whether you're young or you're old, this kind, this, these um, choices are important. So then the third of the constructs 
was that um, higher levels of interest and intrinsic motivation motivate students. And Pinterest suggested that providing stimulating and interesting tasks and activities and materials, including some novelty and variety in tasks and activities, um, is important, as well as providing content material and tasks that are personally meaningful and interesting to students. And this idea of novelty and emergent experiences is woven throughout successful commercial games. This is a game called StarCraft II, which is a, which is a very popular game. Um, and a, you start out with just a few basic tools in terms of people, kinds of units that you can control in a few basic buildings and you fight a few basic enemies. But over time, they increasingly add, um, add variety both in terms of the, the tools you have at your disposal, the challenges that you're facing. Um, and so by that novelty and emergent experience is important as well as this opportunity to provide what they call mini games where you can um, focus on other related skills and by switching the context you give um, you continue to teach things that are int um, that are important that are related um, in a different format and that's and often when people have a choice to switch between so this is also feeds in this idea of the importance of choice and then meaningful play which is something that Salen and Zimmerman um, in their work on games and play more generally have, have articulated in a, in, a, in, a, in a very insightful way in terms of the importance of when someone is um, interacting with a game they are create they're able to create their own meanings and this creation of meaning obviously this the, the the parallels between a lot of constructivist ideas and for engagement um, are both important the fourth is that higher levels of value motivate students and the idea of providing tasks and materials and activities that are relevant and useful to students allowing for some personal identification with school and this is an area where at one level um, a lot of the work on games has been successful or and also very not successful a lot of commercial games the value system is not one that maybe we care about a lot of them focus on destruction a lot of the roles that one is able to take on involve being um, a soldier or a wizard and um, the challenges often involve um, destroying people but there are other identities that people might take on and other values that might be involved there's a game that um, people may be aware of called fold it where um, the players um, are involved in folding proteins and uh, another game called the turna where players are involved in structuring RNA which is part of the DNA transcription process and what they found that's very interesting is that there are dedicated communities of players that will play these games they're set up like puzzle games but it, part of the draw is that there's a um, recognized value or in social value to playing the game because the community of players turns out is actually better than existing computer algorithms at folding proteins or crafting RNA and in fact the community of players are actually better than a lot of scientists at this and so what um, there are now a number of publications in science magazine or the journal of about proteins and RNA sequences that have come out of this so by participating in this community there's real value being generated and this is motivating to these players it's an interesting phenomena um, and in fact the the winners of the various contests part of the reward is that your protein or your RNA um, be, is actually replicated to see and, and, and through this through this work also the computer algorithms have been refined dramatically for folding because um, something that the human mind is much better at than computers um, for, for various reasons another way in, um, that is practiced in schools are um, this idea of epistemic games where rather than being a warrior or a wizard um, the player takes on the role of, in this case, a researcher at a dialysis um, foundation and they're involved in creating a, a membrane, a, a dialysis a membrane prototype. So, or being um, an urban architect. There are a lot of different roles. We don't have, the roles don't have to be warrior and wizard. Um, and they don't have to be even that dramatic. I mean, it's interesting to me that the game The Sims which is one of the biggest selling games of all time involves people taking on the identity of just an average everyday person going about life 
you know, brushing one's teeth, fixing food, getting a microwave. I mean, if people, if, if this suggests that there are a lot of other identities that could be engaging for people to take on, and um, while the commercial world hasn't explored them as deeply, there is certainly room within the educational world to start thinking about how we might let people take on these identities. And this is an important part of standards that are arising. Um, in the United States, there are new science education standards that dramatically focus and increase the emphasis on the players or the, the students' identity as someone who, in, who, who would engage in a science or mathematics or technology career. Whereas the old standards in 1996 still really emphasized, do you know about this thing that other people do? Um, now the standards are becoming increasingly focused on, am I somebody who does that? Could I do that? Would I want to do that? What would it be like to be a member of that community? And this fits with a lot of models, um, sociocultural models of what learning might be. It's not just learning about what those other people do. Learning is being invited into a discourse community and learning to participate in a community. And so games offer a lot of opportunity in this space that people like da David Schaffer in um, University of Wisconsin-Madison are working on in terms of epistemic games. And then the, the fifth um, construct that Pentridge found um, supported richly throughout the literature on motivation to learn is this idea that goals motivate and direct students. And he suggests that um, we should use cooperative and collaborative groups to allow for opportunities to attain both social and academic goals and have them reinforce one another. That we should use task, reward, and evaluation structures that promote mastery, learning effects, progress, and self-improvement standards and less reliance on social comparison or norm reference standards. Oh my. <laughs> um, classroom discourse should focus on mastery learning and understanding um, course and lesson content. And in terms of this, uh, the commercial game world, I'm just looking, um, while learning in the classroom tends to focus on the individual by himself or herself, usually in the absence of any, um, even any artifacts, knowing math is able to sit down and do a math problem without using a calculator um, or talking to anybody. Most of, the, most of the learning that we actually care about outside of school involves what people can do in interaction with other people and in interaction with their artifacts, both, both symbolic as well as physical. Oh, 30 minutes, I have 10, 10 left. You're, no, no. Okay, good. Um, so, and then, and I, this, is, this is something that, that commercial games have begun to figure out. Uh, and then, but around games, when, when we talk about games for learning, we don't have to just talk about inside the game. There's also what happens around the game. And right here we see, in the learning that happens around the game, this is from the Sims um, website. Just went and got this last week. Um, and here we see in the forums, there's a big post uh, with one community member explaining to other community members about his specific website challenges and issues. So this isn't how do you play the Sims and get the biggest house. This is, these are how do you run your website such that you can explain your ideas to other people successfully and broadcast your ideas. So this is about how do you connect the community. Um, and then there are all sorts of other examples of people learning through modding or changing the software around a game or creating digital um, items that can be used within the game. There's all kinds of learning that happens around a game, discussing the mathematics uh, within the, uh, that happens in the game outside the game. Um, but now all these things I've been graying out up until now um, are things that a lot of games for learning and commercial games have largely ignored. Commercial games have tended to ignore th this idea of teachers and coaches because they can't count on that. They don't have that asset. It's interesting, traditional education has teachers um, paid to be there and students who are forced to be there and they have all these other resources that they don't leverage very effectively. Games don't, can't count on having a coach or a teacher. And as a result, because people who do work on games for learning tend to say, well, commercial games do things best, they take that idea and, and overlook this important asset and resource they have. Um, in terms of building a, uh, teachers around a game, so it's a role for the teachers that's often ignored right now in games for learning research. In terms of building these supportive and caring personal relationships in the community around the game, displaying and modeling interest, classroom discourse, um, that should focus on the importance and utility of what they're doing. 
um, and organizational management structures that encourage personal and social responsibility. So I think there, so there are affordances here, but there are also challenges. One thing that's been interesting to me, before I began working on games um, for learning, I worked on simulations. And at that time, you really only, had, during the design process, you were really just looking at the intersection between the, um, the technology, affordances and constraints and budget you were working with, and your learning goals. And so there tended to be a large space everywhere that that, if you think about it, everywhere the blue and the green um, shape are overlapping. That was space to be working in. And that made design fairly easy. But as soon as you decide that this is going to be a game, unless you're doing something really shallow that just involves points and badges, um, you've really constrained the space further. Um, you've added a, a, third, a, a third constraint. And um, this is actually, this is not trivial. You have to really be willing to flexibly explore the design space, whereas in problem solving, there's a classic um, approach to problem solving that many people, or even most people use, which is called hill climbing, where from your, the way you solve a, solve a problem is you always take, a, you take whatever step will take you a little bit closer to your final goal, and people who are involved in a hill climbing problem solution are not willing to go take a step temporarily away that will eventually let them um, move toward it. Um, and you can't do that when you're designing games because you have to really search out the space for a place that will allow you to um, not compromise on any of these three parameters of um, game design, learning goals, and um, the technological affordances and constraint and budget. Obviously, the players need to um, learn and use the, the, the concepts as part of their solution rather than just having them there. A lot of people say, wow, there's lots of physics in that game. People are going to learn physics by playing that game. And people don't say, wow, there's lots of physics in playing soccer. People are going to learn Newton's laws by playing, playing soccer. One, one might learn, one might, or football, I don't know. Soccer, is soccer okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> but so it becomes interesting to think about, well, people might learn about Newton's laws playing soccer if you change the rules and you change the structures around it, but what would be involved? And if you changed it, would people still want to play soccer? So again, you've got your learning goals, you have your um, game, de game design goals, and then in this case, there are some limit technological limitations when one is playing soccer. Um, you don't have a lot of the, in that particular, um, without sort of a technology based on providing the immediate feedback, maybe we have to be leveraging coaches or something else, flashcards, who knows. And there's also this idea that's even more important in terms of design for learning compared to commercial game design and that if, if you're designing learning environments particularly for classrooms, you're designing for a much broader audience. Commercial games have the luxury of the players are self-selecting into what they're going to play. If you are developing for a classroom, um, I would argue you have an ethical responsibility to the students in that classroom across to make sure you're serving all of them, because they don't have a choice. And this, is the, this, is, this is another possible problem with games for learning, is is it still a game if everybody has to play it? Um, and oops. Then there's this idea, 36. Actually, I'm going to move along, of supporting a broad challenge curve. Um, if you think about optimal challenge, Shiksamahai, talking about flow, where challenge and um, ability are equally matched, and if someone enters this flow state, well, if you're in front of the challenge curve, you're bored. If you're behind the challenge curve, you're frustrated. And now if you're making everybody play and they can't self-select, you've got to be, it's not a question of where do you put the challenge curve, it's how wide can you make it so that, so that the, as large a percentage of possible people can be on that curve. And um, my slides will be available. There are some ideas for how that might be done. I've ended up going into greater detail about some of these earlier ideas, but our work really focuses, or the thing I'm most interested in is, how can you more effectively bridge this intuitive understanding that games are so good at creating, and this formal understanding, where, because probably from, from much school learning, we care about the ability of students to take that knowledge outside of the game and apply it to other contexts. And we pro generally often care about their ability to explicitly articulate that understanding. And that's some, a place where, um, again, 
Schools have always focused on the explicit understanding and um, have, as a result, um, without connecting it to any kind of intuitive understanding, have also failed. So that's not saying that games do everything well or schools do everything well, but we have to start looking and thinking about how do we connect the two. So, and we're looking, again, it, just like with this motivation research I talked about, we're looking at um, how to leverage existing research. And we can't take it wholesale. Like when people talk about a prediction and explanation, they assume, well, we'll have them have a journal, and they will stop playing the game, and they will write down their hypothesis. And then they will go back into the game, and they will play, and then later we're going to bring them back to their journal, and they're going to reflect. And so that's an example of just sort of throwing something on, and that just doesn't work well. So again, you have to think very carefully about how to integrate across these ideas. Um, and I'm interested in leveraging prediction through the interface. Oops. And um, self-explanation, like Mickey Chi, through dialogue. And what would those things mean? Um, other people in our group are interested in modeling within gameplay and social engineering. In fact, I'm doing a study on the social engineering that happens around the game in the classroom, as well as in online forums around our games in the classroom. And we're looking at, other people in our group are looking at real-time diagnostics and personalized scaffolding. So actually, the pragmatic suggestions, I'm gonna, I've put this in, since talking to people, since um, arriving, I've realized that's probably less important. For people who would like to talk about that, I can talk to people at another time. I had to send my slides in a while ago. Um, so things that we do, we have a GUI editor. We do a lot of things to make both the programming and the use by the teachers easier, and we focus on low bandwidth. Actually, I'll just you really have to be aware of the constraints in classrooms. That's another thing that, it's, this is not to say that all research conducted on games needs to be applicable to the creation of games that can be used now. But if you want your game to be used now, you have to be very aware of what classrooms are and what the technology is and um, trying to think broadly. So I've but so what are the lessons from games for other educational contexts? A lot of this has been, and I'm certainly not saying all education should be games. Um, it's just a medium with affordances. But I think there are lessons for games or from games for other educational contexts. And it comes back to these general ideas about mo motivation to learn. And the answer doesn't necessarily involve pretending to be goblins. That's sort of my way of saying it doesn't all have to be games. I think what we need to think about is that games also remind us how important these ideas are for education and how miserably we fail currently in other contexts. And so what would it take to change those contexts such that students would be experiencing um, these constructs. Because clearly it can be done. Games are able to get people to pay for the opportunity to do it. And classrooms, with all the resources they have, we generally just make the models simpler and simpler until they're often just rote facts. And then we feel like we are successful if they can answer these rote facts. So what lessons can we take from games to better support and engage learners across contexts? So thank you very much. minutes for questions. I remind everyone that if you don't get the time now, there will be a follow-up face-to-face, uh, smaller, more intimate meeting. Do we have any uh, questions for Doug? Yes. Uh, oh, I play a lot of games. <laughs> I do. I played, for, that's another difference I'd say. A lot of people who, who do research games for learning don't really understand what games are. I was, grew up in the generation, my first job was working in a grocery store. Um, and I would take the quarters that I earned when I was 14 to the arcade. So that's, that's, where, that's where I started. And now, like, in terms of games that I play, um, the Guild Wars 2 screenshots, that's a game I'm currently playing, but I also play a number of, of other games. And it's not like everyone who does research on games needs to play games, but it's good to at least have someone on the team who understands what games are. Mm -hmm. You refer to the skills students need before they start using the games, or do you refer them to the skills that they actually earn during the game, or to both? Well, the, I would say a, successful, a commercially successful game is one that can take a wide bandwidth of players with no, no preconceptions of skills 
and ramp them up successfully in, in, in learning the skills as they need them. That's so, if, if, if a game requires you to have all the skills beforehand, um, it's not going to be commercially successful because few people are going to be able to play it. And I would say it's also a failure of the opportunities. Games have been very, very clever about ways of how do you ramp up these skills over time. So there's maybe the small skills with a small S for, that you need right in the immediate moment to be mastering that challenge, which involves both um, conceptual understanding as well as some more interface kinds of abilities. But then I think it's worth thinking in terms of skills um, in the larger sense, as it is in the standards now, about these process skills, the larger um, skills that one uses when one engages in a profession or around an activity. In terms of science, it might involve argumentation, inquiry, critical thinking. Like in the United States, there's a lot of talk about 21st century skills. And in fact, in the, in, in the meta-analysis, we took the NRC report on 21st century skills and classified learning outcomes according to that. Well, what's interesting in classrooms is that um, so much, we've seen it throughout our work, that even though we, we built a single player game because um, in terms of our funders, there was a real emphasis in the United States on having these um, statistical analyses of learning and using uh, randomized control trials. And so we tried to focus on individual players, but still immediately, there is so much natural collaboration that automatically happens um, throughout the game, and you can't stop it. And it's very, it's very lively, and it's, it's motivating in terms of, a principal came in in a very rough school, and he was very, he just happened to be coming in to observe this teacher as part of an annual evaluation. And all the, the students obviously knew him, he was the disciplinary, he was the one who was in charge of discipline, and they were sort of teasing him, he was teasing them back. But after it, he said, I've never seen these kids so engaged, and I was worried because they were talking loudly to each other, but he understood that, wow, these these kids care so much that they not only need to do what they're doing, but they need to talk to each other and draw everyone in and create these broader meanings. But what happens, unfortunately, or it's interesting, we, we're doing this study where we're looking at the nature of that collaboration that naturally occurs, and as we did it, just letting it without other scaffolding, there was a very low level of um, conceptual discussion in that collaboration. But what was interesting is that by adding in these online forums, there was a slide where I showed a piece of an online forum around the social engineering. There was much higher natural um, conceptual discussion in there from the very same people. And it wasn't just a small percentage. And the forums that happen around commercial games, it's a very small percentage of people who make the really insightful comments. But around here, we had a much larger percentage of, of the students actually engaging in more conceptual discussion than we saw in this natural collaboration. So I think both are important. And one thing I'm interested in is what would it take to scaffold the natural collaborations that happen in real time, face to face, to make them um, a little deeper than what we're seeing. Great. Absolutely. That was, and it, that was sort of related to what, what I, I think exactly as you do. Right now, school tends to focus on this idea of what a person can do by himself or herself in the absence of any, any tools. And that's just not what we do anywhere else outside of school. Everything matters how we work with tools, how we work with other people, and what we can do. Nobody cares about, this scientist did it by himself sitting at a table. We care about what that scientist could do with his tools in his community. Um, and how those ideas can be spread throughout the community. Those are the skills we care about everywhere else except for school. Great. I want to thank Doug again. Um, <laughs> thanks a lot. Exciting.